In this video, I'm gonna answer one of the most common questions I get about industrial design. How do I launch a product? What does it take and how much does it cost? This is gonna be a longer video, so I'm gonna have some timestamps down in the description and you can sort of scroll through that and see what you're interested in specifically. Maybe there's a specific topic that you wanna learn about. Um, so go check that out. Also, if you're not subscribed, you should definitely subscribe. Do it, it helps me, do it. Do it now, do it now, Thinking. do it. So disclaimer before I start, project budgets, timelines, and scopes vary a lot. None of the numbers that I use or timelines that I mentioned in this video should be referenced as any sort of absolute truth. So the first thing that you need to establish is the vision for the project. You need to understand what the goal is for the product and what you hope to achieve with it and I can't stress enough how important this is. If a client comes to me with a concept, I'll ask things like, how did you come up with this idea? How are you defining success for this project or this product? Why is this product important and why should anybody care? Why does this company exist aside from making a profit? What is its purpose? What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my God. Why do you believe all of the above things to be true? Where are you getting this information from? Who are the people who will be involved with this product in terms of using it and purchasing it? They're not necessarily the same thing, especially when it comes to B2B products. I ask these questions at the beginning of any project because I'm trying to understand the essence of what the product is and what it needs to do and what it needs to accomplish. Another thing is that the best way to come up with great solutions is to very clearly define the problem. If you're having trouble coming up with ideas for your products or your projects, it's usually because you don't understand the problem well enough and you need to do more research. If the people that I'm working with don't understand the answers to these questions yet, that's totally fine and actually pretty common. And what I'll typically do is work together with them to figure it out and sort of discover it together. And there are a lot of different ways to do this, but it typically starts with some ethnographic research and really understanding the customer journey and mapping that out in a very clear and concise way. So this might seem pedantic and unnecessary, but I can't stress enough how important this is. You need to have these things articulated in order to have a clear direction for your project. Having these clear goals established will help you make informed decisions. Almost any successful project I've been on has taken great care in this particular step. So if you're still skeptical, here are some really great statements that yielded some incredible groundbreaking products. 1,000 songs in your pocket. This is a great design brief, and it was the brief for the iPod. It's simple, it's concrete, and it's easy to understand. As a designer, this immediately gives you several constraints while also not being overly prescriptive. Another one is the warm, receptive look of a well-used first baseman's mitt to describe the Eames lounge chair. Once again, this is a really great brief. This was a quote by Charles Eames, and I'm not sure if you guys have played baseball before, but if you have, you know how comfortable a broken in baseball mitt is. It just fits like your favorite pair of jeans or a perfectly tailored suit. Looking at the Eames lounge chair, we can see that it's made of plywood, and plywood is a traditionally inexpensive material, much cheaper than quality hardwood. But the Eames elevated the material not only by designing it in a way that leveraged its properties, but also by making it feel luxurious and comfortable, and most importantly, in line with that vision statement. And the plywood bends in a way that cradles the body really beautifully, just like how a baseball mitt bends to the contours of your hand. And this all starts with one simple yet evocative phrase. Now, if you don't do this, the results can be disastrous. I've actually seen this firsthand and it is not pretty. But basically, even if you have all the funding in the world, even if you have the best team, the best designers, it's not gonna matter if you don't have that vision in place. Not only that, but that vision needs to be shared among everybody on the team. Everybody needs to be on board with it. Now, the process for the discovery phase varies greatly. It can be anywhere from one week to, I don't know, three or four months even. Typically, in my past experience, it takes about a month, but once again, it really depends. For the sake of this example, let's just say that we've spent a month on discovery. So once you have a clear vision in mind, you can get started on the typical design process. Just for industrial design services, on the very low, low end of the scale, it's still gonna cost you thousands of dollars to develop a product, and that's for a very junior designer who's probably gonna make a lot of mistakes. If you hire a senior designer, that's gonna be on the order of tens of thousands of dollars, but they will help to maximize the chances of success for your product. Consultancies can cost 
hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes even millions of dollars in certain situations. Um, and they're quite expensive, but they're also a one-stop shop where you pretty much get everything all under one roof. And they often have a lot of clout where they can actually help promote your product. I get it, there's a huge price variance here in terms of what you're paying for, and it can be hard to decide what makes the most sense for you. If you have a very limited budget, it might make sense to hire a more junior designer. They will require some supervision, but if you have somebody on the team who has prior experience with product development, this might make sense. The more senior designer is maybe more suited to funded startups or smaller companies. They also make a lot of sense if you're a large corporation and you're starting a new project and you need that specialized knowledge or you know just an extra hand in the studio, that also can make a lot of sense. Next up are the consultancies. Now, consultancies vary considerably in terms of their, their scale and what they offer. I mean, you could have a little two-person sort of boutique consultancy or you could have a giant multinational corporation. And because of that, it's really hard for me to evaluate uh, when it makes sense to hire one. Typically for the bigger sorts of consultancies, it really only makes sense if you're a multinational corporation or if you are a very, very well-funded late stage startup. Now, regardless of the type of designer or design business that you hire, the process is going to be pretty much the same where you start with research, you begin ideation, then refinement, and then you implement the design. Okay, so let's come back to the timeline. At this point, you've spent probably tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the complexity of the project. You've already spent one month on discovery. Remember how I said, just for the sake of example, we'd spend one month on discovery. So typically, the design of the product can take anywhere from one month up to years. For the sake of this example, let's just say it took four months. So right now we're at five months of development time and tens of thousands of dollars invested. So with all that said, there are ways to save time and money in this area. I think the best way to save time is to have a clear vision for what the product needs to do, bar none. The reason for that is it'll help you make decisions more quickly. You're less likely to need to make big pivots in terms of the direction of the project, which often wastes a lot of time. It'll just make things a lot more streamlined. Another thing is to build lots of crude, fast prototypes. You know, use foam core, use cardboard, just build simple mechanisms, really understand the process in a way that's scrappy and fast so that you can save time and money in that way. At some point, sort of towards the middle of the ideation phase, we're still sort of in the development phase, I'll start to think about how things are gonna be manufactured. I don't like to do it too early because I don't wanna to be too constrained, but there are many parallel paths that you can take. So it's not like it needs to be, okay, articulating the vision and then concept development and then design for manufacturer. A lot of these things can sort of overlap in order to save time as well. Now, in regards to design for manufacturer, just because the product is designed does not mean that it's ready to get made. That's where design for manufacturer or DFM comes in. So let's move on to that next. So I'm not an engineer or anything, but I have made it a point in my career to understand engineering constraints and learn how to speak with engineers and understand where they're coming from. This is important because if you don't do this, engineers will start to make design decisions for you because you don't know what you're talking about. And that never ends well, believe me. There's a lot of nuance to this subject and it's very dependent on the project, but a good rule of thumb is to reduce part complexity, reduce the number of components in your assembly, and lower the part assembly times. So just like in design, the more you can simplify your manufacturing process, the better. One really great example of a product that's manufactured effectively, but also designed really well for the time were the Fender electric guitars of the 1950s and the 1960s. Leo Fender was obsessive about cutting costs while maintaining quality. With a simple slab body and a neck that was bolted on with screws rather than using complex wood joinery methods, the cost of the Fender guitar was accessible to everyone and there was no real sacrifice in quality. The body of older Fender electric guitars were cut from a solid slab of inexpensive alder wood and then the edges were rounded off with a router. Pickups and neck routes were cut with simple templates and jigs. If you contrast this with the way stringed acoustic instruments were made, the difference is pretty insane. Acoustic instruments require excessive bracing and bending and very precise movements. Fender managed to make an instrument that was not only inexpensive and accessible, but also high quality and durable, which was important for the working musician. Now, design for manufacturer is usually built into the second half of the design process. 
Just like every phase in this process that I'm outlining, it's hard to put an exact timeline on it because there's just so much variance and nuance to this. For some of the simpler projects I've done, DFM might only take a couple weeks. For some of the more complex parts that I've done or multi-part assemblies and things like that, it could take several months and in some cases it can take a year. In one case, I was working with a team to develop a completely new manufacturing process and it took us over a year to refine this process to a point that we were all happy with. Now, once again, just for the sake of example, let's just say that this process takes two to three months, let's say three months more realistically, and we are now at eight months total for the discovery, the design, and design for manufacturing. So throughout the DFM process, as a sort of parallel path, you should be starting to scope out manufacturers, and that's what we're gonna talk about next, manufacturing. So if you're gonna manufacture a product, you're going to need an engineer to look over the work to ensure that it can be produced. Most products have mechanical components and all products will need to be mass produced, right? So engineers typically cost just as much or more than industrial designers. And if your project uses electricity or batteries, you're gonna need an electrical engineer in addition to a mechanical engineer. So I'm not an engineer, so I don't even wanna estimate the costs, but basically expect to spend thousands of dollars for every engineer you add onto the team. Tooling cost is typically no less than a few thousand dollars per part, but once again, that's a starting point. Some manufacturing methods and production methods are cheaper than others. So making a thermoform die of a small coffee cup lid might be under a thousand dollars. But if you're making an injection mold tool for a grocery shopping basket that's huge, that could be tens of thousands of dollars. Keep in mind, if your project has individual parts, you have to make a tool for each individual piece or component. So if your product is a fork or something really simple, that's just one part, that's one piece. But if your product is, let's say a camera, there are many components that go into that and you're going to need to make a tool for each one of those pieces. Because of that, you're actually gonna have to pay to have multiple molds made. Now, once again, that's just the beginning. If you have a multi-cavity mold, that is a mold that allows you to shoot multiple parts at the same time. That's gonna increase the cost as well, although it will decrease the per unit cost. The price of tooling can move up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially if there are a lot of parts and if they're very complex. I'll typically talk to multiple manufacturers for a given design. If I don't know specific contacts, I'll just look on Alibaba or other websites like that as a starting point. Eventually you will have to visit the factory or have a trusted manufacturing liaison visit the factory on your behalf. So assuming scoping out a manufacturer takes one month, Tooling takes six to eight weeks and production and assembly of the parts takes an additional month. We can safely say that this process is gonna take 12 months. After that, the products need to be shipped to you, which can take an additional four to six weeks if your product is made overseas, which almost all products are. And we're now conservatively 13 months into the design process. After that, it's time to distribute to stores. One thing I wanna make clear is that this is an absolutely ideal best case scenario and it rarely goes this smoothly. It's more common that the manufacturing and design process is gonna take closer to 18 months or two years. Medical products can be even longer than that. The fastest I've ever had a product launch from the initial kickoff meeting to actually having it in customers' hands was I think six months. And that was a very, very simple product and it was an incredibly compressed timeline and it was quite stressful to go through. So in many situations, you can save money in this area. So for example, if you're manufacturing a table lamp or light fixture, you're going to need a switch that turns the light on and off. Now, typically you're going to use an off the shelf part. If the switch isn't an integral part of the design, it's just way, way cheaper, at least at lower volumes. If you design it from scratch, you're gonna have to pay thousands for the tooling. You're gonna have to hire an electrical engineer to make sure that it's safe. You're gonna have to make sure that it's UL compliant and in line with a whole bunch of other government agencies. It's a big undertaking for a relatively small part of the design. You have to decide on a very case by case basis what makes sense to use as an off the shelf part versus what makes sense to actually design from scratch. And if you have a clear vision for your project, it'll help you articulate that. That's why it's so important to have that vision. It starts to make sense to build components in-house once you start to get into the millions of units, like if you're Apple and you're making you know, millions and millions of iPhones or something like that. Once you have your tools and dies made, the next step is to sort of establish your order quantities. Basically, as a general rule, 
the higher the order quantity, the lower the price is per unit. So once again, that's just a balancing act that you'll need to figure out on a case by case basis. If your order quantities are low enough, it might actually make sense to order an aluminum tool instead of a stainless steel one. They might only last for about 10,000, 15,000 shots, but that might be more than enough to just sort of test out the market and see if it's a viable product. Then you can invest in a steel tool later if you want to. Because tooling is so expensive and it's really, really hard to change or reverse, I can't stress enough the importance of having a very robust intermediary prototyping process. So maybe before you make a 3D print, you make something out of cardboard. Before you make the tool, you 3D print something. Before you make a steel tool, you make an aluminum tool or a soft tool, or maybe even a 3D printed tool. That's something you can do, which we'll talk about in a second. It's just a really good way to do user testing and mitigate risk. I've even used hand-operated injection molding tools, which you can buy for less than $2,000. Then what you can do is you can 3D print a mold for a few hundred bucks. This mold will typically crack or break in less than a hundred shots, but it's a great way to shorten lead times and move quicker to learn and test your designs. So this was a lot of information. Just as a recap, a few ways to save time and money is to use off-the-shelf parts for your designs when it makes sense to. Build lots of crude prototypes rather than waiting weeks to complete a finished design only to realize that it's not what you wanted. Use intermediary tooling methods like 3D printed tools or aluminum tools instead of going straight to expensive stainless steel tools. So in addition to all of this, you need to take local, state, and federal regulations into account. So. There might be governing bodies that dictate certain sorts of regulations around what your product can legally do. Um, this is especially relevant if you're working in the medical space or the food space. Another example is with lamps. Let's say you're designing that table lamp that I was talking about a few minutes before. You need to make sure that that lamp is UL compliant. You need to speak to UL and understand what the constraints are. Depending on the type of lighting design that it is, you may need to pay $5,000 just to get it UL certified. Otherwise, no contractor in their right mind is gonna buy it. All right, so fast forward two years and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you have a product, the hard part is over, right? <laughs> Sadly, that is not the case. Designing, while it isn't easy, what's even more difficult is actually marketing and selling the product. And that requires an entirely different budget and the strategy might be related to it, but it is a different part of the process that you need to take into account. While proper funding is important, the real deciding factor in the success of a product is having that clearly established vision for the product, having a great team, and just being able to persevere through it. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to learn more about this process. Thanks again, guys.